All right, all right. Well, good morning, guys. I am glad to be with you as always. We are here in um, 1 John. So if you have your Bibles, if you open up to the book of 1 John, we're going to start in chapter 2. Um, Dr. Pete is not here today, so he asked me to fill in. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to do so. It's always exciting to share the word of God. And so we're going to look at 1 John here, chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 28 and it says like this, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it, is, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that, we, that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And verse 10 says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Yeah, right? Hopefully I can do that in 30 minutes. If not, you will not have any time to talk at the table. Anyway, you will have time to talk at the table. I promise you that today. But we are in this series called The Way of Great Men. And as, you, as we just read together, you see that this is a pretty intense chapter that we're going to go through. And a lot of stuff that is here is going to be very challenging. And the, real, the reality of this is, is that this whole series has been filled with great challenges. There's three things in particular that you will notice. And, and the first one is that there's a challenge for the area of morality, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is dealing with our obedience to the scriptures and the obedience to the word of God. The second one is a social challenge or relational challenge dealing with our love towards one another, and then the third area is in the area of doctrine, dealing with us in regards to the truth and how we embrace and understand the truth of God. And the one thing that we realize here at Forge is that we want to be men that are great according to the way God declares greatness. Not men who are great by the world's standards, but men who are great by the standards of Scripture. And so if we're going to be men that are going to be great, that are going to do that, then our pursuits must be rooted in our identity in Christ as sons of God, as, the, as those who are children of God because of the blood of Jesus. And what will happen is when our pursuits and our desires are rooted in that identity, then what occurs is that we begin to pursue things for the glory and for the honor of Jesus. And so today I have a big idea for us, and this is it. It is that our morality must be rooted in our relationship with God through Jesus and motivated by the return of Christ. I'll say that one more time. Our morality must be rooted in our relationship with God through Jesus and motivated by the return of Christ. And so when we think about us living moral lives and us living the scriptures and doing what it is that God has called us to do, the, we have to ask the question, what is the motivation for that? Where is the foundation for that? And it's founded in our relationship with Jesus. But there's something else that we're looking forward to. And I don't know that we necessarily think about this enough or that we consider this enough. And it is the return of Christ. That we as Christians are looking forward to a day that everything is going to change drastically and dramatically. It's the return of Jesus, a day when there's going to be no more tears, there's going to be no more sorrow. You're not going to worry about your job any longer. You're not going to worry about paying a mortgage. Whatever issues you may be facing, all of those things will be gone. Because what? Because Jesus returns and now it's a different, it, it, everything is completely different. And for us as believers, what the Apostle John here is doing 
doing is he is encouraging them to live for this day, this return of Christ, to look forward to that day. And so the first thing you have in your outline there is that practice makes permanent. So let's look at verses 28 to verse 29. It says this, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, there it is, his appearing, looking at his return, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. There's that word practice, and we'll see it in here a few times. But practice makes permanent. And so for some of you that may know, I used to be the music director in our church for a while. We didn't have anyone that was there. And so as a music director, one of the things that I was very adamant about was when we came to rehearsal, it wasn't to learn songs. It was to come together and practice what we have learned on our own. And one of the girls as part of the worship team, she, she, she made the statement in one of our meetings and she said, practice makes permanent. And so a lot of times we hear practice makes perfect, right? But practice makes permanent. And so if I am practicing, if I'm rehearsing something on my own, then what happens is when I come together with my other brothers and sisters in this group, then I'm going to do what? I'm going to execute what I've been learning. I'm going to execute the thing that I've been practicing. As a, as a young guy, I was in, um, in, I used to love football. That was actually the reason why I stopped going to church because I love football so much. And in Little League, you know, I was uh, in my, I played two years in Little League. First year, I was a little skinny guy. Wish I was a little skinny guy still. I was a little skinny guy in, in Little League. And I remember um, being, being in Little League the first year, I didn't play very much. I played, you know, a few times. But the second year, in between the first year and the second year, I started lifting weights with my uncle and, you know, started running a lot. And so the second year, I was an all-star. I was amazing. You know, it's, amazing. it's easy to be an all-star in Little League, just let you know. But nonetheless, you know, I, I, I started on the, on the offense. I, you know, started on defense. I was on all the special teams. And I remember that, you know, one, in one practice, we were, we, we were at this practice, and the the one principle that I learned was that you have to practice like you're going to play. You don't, you, don't, you don't practice half speed because then what happens is your timing is off when you get out there on the field and you're going to actually try, you're trying to play. And there was one kid, I'm not a very fast runner and I ran, but I'm not like super speedy, right? And so I'm a stronger guy, but I'm not super fast. But there was one guy that he was, he was a tailback and this guy was fast. And if you weren't running, there was plenty of times that I was running half speed and guess what? I could feel his hand on my back pushing me like Jason go and I wasn't going to be running like that in the game. And so I learned that I had to practice a certain way in order for me to live something out, in order for me to execute the way that I was supposed to. And it's the same thing for us as we walk in our relationship with Jesus. One of the tensions that I see within the grace alone community, that's who we are, right? We're, we're saved by grace, are we not? Right? We're saved by grace. So that's our identity in Christ, that we have been saved by the grace of God because of what Jesus did for us. We're his sons, and so now we are able to walk in this relationship. But the tension that I see within the Grace Alone community are these extremes where there is either no effort to grow in morality or an overemphasis on grace, or there's an emphasis on morality or you know, behavior modification and not enough emphasis on grace. And so we have these two tensions that I see, and I, and, and I can tell you this because I come from the side that was more on the morality emphasis, and not so much the emphasis on grace. And then a few years back, I, I, was, at a, I was at a conference for, for leaders, and in this conference, I encountered the grace of God and the message of grace that was so liberating. As the preacher was speaking, I began to understand that my identity, my worth, and my value had zero to do with all of my accomplishments in this world, but it had everything to do with what Jesus had done for me. That I was loved not because I was successful as a preacher, because I was successful as a church leader, because I was successful as a husband, because I was successful as a father, that I was loved simply because of what Jesus did. And it was like I could just take a breath, like, wow. I don't have to base my acceptance before God on the things that I do, but I can, but I can base my acceptance before God on what Jesus has done for me. But see, what I, what, what I find is that then there comes this other place, this other side that you can easily fall into the trap. Well, because I'm accepted because of what Jesus has done, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to grow in grace. I don't have to grow in obedience. And then you have the argument, you know, it's not about behavior modification. But here's the deal. It's not an either or, it's a both and issue. 
The Apostle John makes it crystal clear as he's speaking in these scriptures. He makes it clear to us. He shows us that there is a need for us to change, for us to grow, for our behavior to change. You know, if you think about it like this, the Bible tells us not to lie. So if you were a liar, then guess what happens? Your behavior must be modified. Hello. This is what should happen, right? It's behavior modification, right? And when you look at Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, he's communicating about, you know, adultery and things like that. And he goes, he takes it to a whole nother level. And he's like, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery already. Wait a second. Time out now. Behavior modification. You got to change the things you look at. You got to keep your eyes, you know, I'm going to call it above level. Hello. Behavior modification. But the, but the issue is this, is that we don't just change our behavior, we are changed because we understand what Jesus has done for us, and now I want to live for his glory because I am a son. If you think about it, I mean, for all of us, you know, mo most of us in here, we, ha we have children. Some of us don't have children, and so that's okay, but for the rest of us, we have children, and we understand that our children at a certain age, all they care about is pleasing mommy and daddy. That's it. And, and it's because of one thing. It's not because they're worried about getting spanked. They're worried about going into timeout. It's because they love you. Because they've experienced your love. And so that, that, that's what they want to do. And it's the same thing for us that we are supposed to be growing, abiding. And um, the, the apostle tells us here again. And remember, last week we talked about this abiding in the anointing. And John chapter 5, you can write that one down. Um, the gospel of John chapter 5, Jesus introduces this idea of abiding where he says that I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. And he talks about us not being able to bear fruit apart from him. We're not able to do anything apart from him. And he tells us to abide in him, to abide in his word, to abide in his love. This abiding, this dwelling, and this remaining in Christ, this is something that all true believers should be doing. And what I can tell you is from my own experience is that when I came to Christ, there was something that happened inside of me. I wanted to be in the presence of God. I wanted to be in a relationship. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this, I didn't even want to become a Christian because I was afraid of all of the friendships that I was going to lose. I was afraid that I was going to be alone, but that was because I had not encountered the one who never leaves you alone. I hadn't encountered the one that is with you every step of the way. And whether you feel his presence or not, that is irrelevant. The reality is he promises you to be with you. He promises you that he is there with you. And you know what he wants from you? He wants you to separate time with him so you can abide in his presence. So you can be in his presence. That should be something that comes natural to us as his sons, that we want to be in the presence of God. I love my son. My son is three, three years old. He's going to be four in June. And my son, he has separation anxiety or something like that. Like my son does not want to be anywhere that we are not. And it's not just me, it's all of us. Like, we'll go somewhere, and, you know, if one of us is not in the room or one of us is not somewhere, he's always like, where's mommy? Or where's daddy? The other night, you know, I let my daughter sleep in the room with my wife. And so I'm sleeping across the house. And I, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. And my son gets up to go to the restroom. And when he gets up to go to the restroom, because for some reason my son does not want to go to the bathroom until he absolutely has to go. Like he waits to the last second, right? This is the first time I've um, potty trained a boy. So it's an amazing experience. My daughter was not like that. My daughter's going to the bathroom all the time. My son, no. I'm like, you want to go to the, you know, the, the restroom? No. But he's like, no. I mean, he will literally wait. The other day on, sun, on Sunday, this is an amazing story. I uh, wake him up. You know, he gets up about 8 o'clock or something, like about 7.30. And it is now um, 10, around 10 o'clock. And I'm getting ready to get up and preach. And he's standing next to me. And he goes like this. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I cannot go and take you to the bathroom right now. So glory to God, my daughter was there and I was able to send her. But my son wakes up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and I hear him screaming from the other room, where's daddy? Where's daddy? Where's daddy? Because I wasn't laying in my bed. He just wants to be around me. And for us as sons, that's the same thing for us. We should just want to be in daddy's presence. We should want to be where God is. 
That is what abiding is. And so when we look at this abiding as, as we abide in the presence of God, I want you to know abiding in the presence of God is not some mystical something that's weird, right? That's not what that is. It's about being in his presence, being in his word, being with God. That's what we're supposed to as children, as children of God desire to be. And so as we make abiding a habit, our preferences will change. And then what will happen is our practices will change. In verse 29, he says, if you know that he is righteous, you you know that everyone who practice you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him it's a practice that changes so all of a sudden my practice has changed the second thing that is in your outline here is perm permanent does not mean perfect look at verses 1 through 3 it says behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. It's like John just goes from telling us to abide, to be in the anointing, to practice righteousness, to all of a sudden he breaks out in this moment of praise in the midst of this. And he's like, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it does not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And so the more we practice righteousness, the more we abide in the presence of the Lord, the more we abide in the word of God, and the more we seek, seek to know the Lord, the more permanent and evident morality becomes in our lives. And so as we're abiding in him, what begins to happen is we begin to look more like him. We begin to think like him. We begin to act like him. But can I say this? That doesn't mean perfectly. It doesn't mean that every moment of my life I think exactly like Jesus. It doesn't mean every moment of my life I respond exactly like Jesus. That's why the book of Romans chapter 3 12 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us has arrived at this place of perfection. And so again, what, what happens is we're drawn back to the key or to the foundation of why we obey him. What is he, again, John comes and he is excited about this. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Why do I want to obey? Again, goes back to the story I just told you about my son. Well, your, your children, you know this. And you can think back to when you were a child. I mean, you can, I mean, we can think back far enough. I hope you can. And you can remember when you really, your real motivation was to please your parents. You really wanted to please them. You really wanted them to be happy with you and what it was that you were doing. And so we have that kind of idea that should be going on in our lives. Again, we're drawn back to that foundational principle, our sonship. And what should this do? This should lead us. Continue reading here. He says, and therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. And so what happens when we are being transformed? All of a sudden we live differently than the world does. Our motivations and our motives are different than that of the world, as well as our actions. They don't know us. They don't understand why we don't respond the way that they respond. They don't understand why we don't have the same ambitions that the world does. And listen, guys, if we have the same ambitions as the guy that's sitting next to me who does not know Jesus and I'm, and I'm living the way that he does, you need to check your heart. And that's why John is pointing this out. So we are not deceived. So we don't think, man, you know, if there's no change, if there's not some different desires in me, then there's a problem. There's an issue. There's something going on. So no matter, and here's the thing, no matter what, continue reading here. Beloved, now we are children of God. We're children of God right now, according to what John is telling us. Right now we're children of God. But look what he says. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so here's what I want you to know. Even on your best day, you haven't arrived. Even on the day that you feel like you, listen, you feel like you're walking on the clouds. I mean, you treated your wife perfectly. You treated your kids perfectly. You didn't raise your voice. That person cut you off and you were like, God bless you. 
You're like, I guess they're having a bad day. You know, that, that day, you know, that day when you, I mean, you were just firing on all cylinders of your Christianity. You felt like everything. I want you to know you haven't arrived yet. I don't want, I don't want to discourage you. You should strive for those days. But what I want you to realize is that John is saying what is going to be of us, what we're going to be like has yet to be revealed. What we're going to be like has yet to be seen by us. And so we strive toward that because what? Because we have hope. Look what he says in verse three. And everyone who has this hope in him, pure purifies himself just as he is pure. So what do we strive for? We strive after purity. We strive to be pure and righteous. We strive to live morally because of what? Because of the hope of that future that we talked about earlier. The third thing that's on your outline there, perfection is the motivation of our practice. Verses, verses 4 through 10, look what it says here. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested, speaking of Jesus, he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides, there's that word abide again, in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now listen, I want to pause for a moment on that verse. I want you to listen to what that just said. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, I want you to know that if this, if this, if this verse right here should, should cause all of us to think for a moment. But, but I, what, what I want to say is that this is not saying that we do not sin. When you look at the idea that is presented here, this is a, this is a word that's talking about sinning. It is a present tense word that is a continual thing. It's someone who is not continuing in sin. That's the idea here that the Apostle John is talking about. Because all of us in this room, if we're honest, we all sin. Every one of us in here, we sin. Every one of us in here, we fall short. But John is talking about the practice of sin. That we don't, if we abide in him, we don't practice sin. If we abide in him, we're not comfortable in our sin. If we abide in him, we are not okay in our sin. If we abide in him, as a matter of fact, if we're really abiding in him, the Bible says, I'm doing a series in the book of James right now. The Bible talks about the word of God being the mirror and so if I'm really abiding in him, then you know what's happening? What's happening is I am in the word of God. I am looking in the mirror of God's word. And I'm looking at the reflection of myself in that word. And I am not comfortable anytime I see something that is out of alignment with what I should be looking like because of what Jesus looks like. When I read scripture and I see that the scripture tells me that I should be doing these things, then I consider those and I'm like, wait a second, am I doing those things? When I read the scriptures and the scriptures say I should not be doing those things, then at the same, I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at my heart and I'm looking at my reflection. I'm saying, okay, God, I'm not doing those things. So if we're abiding in him, then we should not be practicing sin. Verse seven, it says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Come on now. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now look at this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And so what I want you to see here is I said perfection is the motivation of our practice. And here is, here is the truth. The truth is that our motivations are so very important. What motivates you? What, what, what is your deepest inspiration? What is your deepest motivation? What is it that really moves you? Think about that. It's important. Because the bottom line is this. It, it, it is, and, and this is just to keep it simple. If Jesus is not your motivation, then you know what? Your motivation is not going to be one that's lasting. If guilt is your motivation, guess what? You're going to get sick and tired of being driven by guilt. If your spouse is your motivation, mm-hmm. Her voice is, going to be, is, is not going to be as motivating. <laughs> if your motivation is trying not to be like that absentee father, guess what? That motivation is going to become overwhelming. 
But when your motivation is Jesus, that's the right motivation. Why? Because Jesus has, is, is twofold in the way that he deals with us. Number one, he is highly invitational. He invites us all in to abide in his presence. But Jesus never says, hey man, come to me. I, I say this often. Jesus says, come to me as you are, but you're not going to stay as you are. If you're really going to walk, oh yeah, Jesus ate with sinners, but he was changing them. Hello. Jesus sat down with whoever, but I guarantee you, when he was sitting down with them, it was to bring change to their life. Jesus wasn't becoming more like the world. He was bringing change into people's lives. And so when Jesus is my motivation, I experience the invitation, the welcome. I experience him inviting me into his presence, but then I also experience him doing what? He is also challenging me to live more like him, to live more fully for his glory. So three things I want you to, you can write these down if you're taking notes there. Now, these three things of perfection. First, First of all, it's the perfect law, it's the perfect sacrifice, and it's the perfect seed. Those are the three things that should be our motivation when we look at why it is that we are going to live for his glory. The perfection that motivates us, it's, it's the perfect law. Verse 4 tells us this. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, as sin is lawlessness. And so the first thing that we see is the perfect law of God. God's law shows us what it is that we are supposed to do. It is God's standards that he reveals to us, and he shows us where we are to live, how we are to obey his word. So it's the perfect seed that we're that, that we're motivated or the perfect law that we are motivated by in order to obey God because we know what his standards are and so we say okay God you've called me to do this and so I'm going to strive toward this I may fall short and I will but I'm going to strive toward this I'm going to strive to be the man of God that you've called me to be that's what we do the perfect law the perfect law listen the law does not lower for anyone are you here the law doesn't lower for anyone. God doesn't say, well, you know, Jason, I, I, know that you, I know that you were raised without a dad, and I know that you didn't see a good example of a husband in your, in your home as you were growing up. So you know what? You don't really have to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Don't worry about it. You, you, you can exasperate your children. You can, you can discourage your children. You can overwhelm them because, you know, you didn't have that example. He didn't say that. The standards are where they are and the perfect law of God. But we don't want to be lawless. We don't want to live according to our desires. But here's verse five. The second one here is the perfect sacrifice. Look at this. I, lo I love this. It says, and you know that he was manifested, speaking of Jesus, to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has, ne has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil for the devil. Devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so we see two things here. Number one is we see that he came to do what? He, was he, he, he came to, to take away our sins, right? John the baptizer, what did he say? He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so he's pointing to Jesus. I love what one commentator said in, in, comment in commenting on this passage. It says that he atones for the sins of the past and prevents sins of the future. He atones for the sins of the past, prevents sins from the future. How does he do that? Well, the first one, he takes away the sins, right? He takes away our sins. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died, to take away, to deal with our sin. But the second one is what? He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. He was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And so that second thing that we see, the perfect sacrifice, is that it, it, what he's talking about, the works of the devil, is the blindness and bondage that man is in while they are under the sway or the influence of the wicked one. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, it tells us what? It says that he, speaking of Jesus, disarmed powers and principalities, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Speaking of what? The cross. What Jesus does is he disarms the enemy. And while the enemy is at work, what you and I can know as men, as sons, is this, is that he came to take away the sins of the world and he came to, he came to destroy the works of the devil. So we're not bound under that. And the third perfect thing is this. In verse 9, look at what it says. It says, whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. The result of our salvation is not just yet to be fulfilled promises, but an abiding reality of God's presence within us. And so the first way we know, we, we know the book of Ephesians tells us what? That we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And so the Spirit of God dwells in us. But then this scripture here gives us a reason why we don't sin. Because there is a seed that remains in us. 
Now, every man that is in this room, every person who walks this planet, every one of us has this same thing. We are here because of a seed. When you look up this word in the Greek, it is the word sperma, and it's where we get the word sperm from. And since we're among men, we're okay to talk about that. But here's the deal. The reality is, is that every one of us is here because of a sperma. Hello. Every one of us, naturally, we're here because of a sperma. I told you, I wasn't raised with my father. You know what my mom used to tell me? I didn't meet my dad until I was like 13 years old. My mom used to tell me all the time, don't look at me like that. You look like your dad. What did I do to look like my dad? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. There was a sperma that made me look like my dad. That's just the bottom line. There were certain characteristics that I didn't learn from my dad. They were just DNA. They were deposited in me before I was, I mean, listen, it was a sperma that came together. And so now I'm here and I have certain characteristics that are just natural. Can I tell you something? The same exact thing happened to you on a supernatural level. The sperma of God, the word of God, when we're talking about the sperma, we're talking about the seed of God's word. The living word of God dwells within us. Listen, this is not just some book, okay? These are living words, and, and it is by, the Bible tells us what? In the book of Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all of those who believe, Jew first, then the Gentile. What does he, what does he communicate? The power of the gospel, what changed our lives, what changed our hearts, what transforms us is the power of God's word that comes to dwell in us. So you know what happens? When we come to Jesus, the old man dies, the new man comes to life because of what? Because of the divine nature of God that now dwells within us. And so for us, we're able to say, well, wait a second, I shouldn't be living in a manner that doesn't bring glory to God because of what? Because number one, his law, his standards are high and he shows me that. I shouldn't be living a way that doesn't bring glory to God because what? His perfect sacrifice. I shouldn't be living in a way that doesn't bring glory to God because what? Because his sperma, his, his word dwells in me. His nature dwells in me. I'm a new creation according to the scriptures. That's what the Bible says. I'll close with this, guys. I went over by like six minutes so far. I apologize. <laughs> For us to practice sin or to continue in sin is a direct contradiction to all that God has done to redeem us. It is incompatible with the perfect law of God that instructs us. It is incompatible with the perfect sacrifice of Jesus that frees us. And it is incompatible with the perfect seed of God that abides in us. I love what one commentator said as well. He said, whenever a Christian sins, he is struggling with an identity crisis. Think about that. Whenever we sin, we forgot who we are. Whenever we sin, we forget what he did for us. And listen, I, I would lie to you to tell that I'm perfect, that I've arrived at that place where I do not sin. But what I do know is that I know this. Every time that I sin, I am doing something that's incompatible with what Jesus did for me. Look at verse 10, and we'll, and we'll finish here, and you guys will talk about it. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Listen, this is crystal clear. There's no in-between. It's not like a child of God and the devil. No, no. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. And I just want to look at the first part of this. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. The scriptures are clear. We can test and know the sincerity of our own faith and that of others in what we practice. So my question is, what are you practicing? Talk about that. My closing thought today is great men hate sin greatly. Great men hate sin greatly. I want you to think about what sin does bigly. <laughs> they hate sin greatly. Sin is destroying families. Sin is destroying men. Sin is destroying our nation. That's just the reality. And if we're, and, and we're going to be great men the way that God declares greatness, then we will hate sin in a great way. And so let's live that way. Let's live for the glory, for the honor of Jesus, and let's hate sin the way that God does. I mean, he put his son on the cross because he hated sin so much. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for this day. Thank you for my brothers here today. 
Thank you for your word that is true. Thank you for your word that sets us free. And I thank you today because you remind us that your law is perfect, that your sacrifice was perfect, and that you are perfecting us for your glory and for your honor, God. I pray for your blessing upon my brothers in this day and the remainder of their week. Be with them in great ways, Lord God. Let your light shine brightly through us. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. And every man said, Amen. Amen. Amen.